Workplace Champions is made possible by Workday. Hello and welcome to Workplace Champions. This episode will be featuring the workforce insights and commentary of three finance leaders, including CFO Stephen Mitchell of Redgate Software, CFO Jared Poff of Designer Brands, and CFO Tom Fenimore of Luminar Technologies. And once again, we're pleased to feature performance management guru Brett Knowles as our resident thought leader as we together seek to highlight the takeaways from our distinguished group of workplace champions. Brett Knowles joins us after this. In a world that's always changing, one thing never does. Your need to adapt, your need to evolve, your need to grow. That's why we built Workday a single finance HR and planning system that can change as your needs change and evolve as the world evolves. To learn how Workday is helping midsize organizations embrace the future with confidence, visit us at Workday.com. Hi, it's Jack, and I'm here with Brett Knowles. Brett has been out and about the globe. You haven't wasted any time in the new year. It seems like you've been a little bit of everywhere, Brett. Uh, But before we talk uh, about that, you did send me an article. Uh, But most importantly, uh, we'll we'll talk about the article, but most importantly, uh, uh, we ended the last episode with you mentioning chat GPT. And again, this is more than 30 days ago, I think. Which almost seems a world apart from where we are now as far as uh, some of the conversations I'm sure all of us are having about how this type of AI technology uh, is likely to to change things. I know when we got off the episode last time, you shared some additional thoughts with me regarding uh, the human capital realm and AI technology. And um, I was really hoping we could open up and discuss some of what uh, the observations you were sharing, and I'm sure you've done a, a good deal of thinking since. Uh, but uh, again, you uh, you were uh, among the first to bring it to my attention, and it was only within days, I think it landed on the front section of the New York Times business section and other business publications picked up on it. But you were the first. Don't want to give you too much credit there. Uh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> I think this chat GPT uh, and many other things fit into um, our conversation today. T- to me, um, the interesting thing is, I think the uh, contract, how we work with employees is in a huge transition. I think we all believe that the COVID was a one and done. We had this big event. It forced us to figure out how to work from home. Great. We're now into this new normal. And uh, I don't think that we're into the new normal yet. Uh, I have thought we were. I'm sure on our conversations, Jack, I've said, you know, this is what the new normal looks like. Now that I have got back on the road and spent a lot of time in the Middle East and Asia and U.S. and Europe, there is no uh, level. We still see huge turmoil in the whole human capital side. And I believe what we're seeing um, are continued stressors. So one of the key dynamics in business now is this rise of uncertainty. You know, the pandemic opened our eyes to it. The work from home thing has opened our eyes to it. But even things like chat GPT completely change um, what work looks like. Literally, when I was exposed to that, I was um, driving along with one of my my sons, and you know he uh, did a quick um, OKR uh, article on Chat GPT while we we're driving along, and I recognized in that moment that I was glad that I'm a few years away from retirement because 
this role of consultant is obsolete, right? If I'm looking for a sounding board or advice, chat GPT can do that right now. Like it's just, it's made the structure of work far more uncertain. Um, think of applying that in a chat bot or an automated phone system. Uh, you know, already it's at the point where it can give us more intelligent feedback than I'm getting from many of the support lines I call. So age of uncertainty and the rise of that seems to be increasing. I think the other thing we're seeing that we all know about is distributed teams. So yes, we're aware because of the work from home environment that we're able to hire people on a global basis for our local teams. That's a stressor. As you know, I believe tools like OKRs help us grapple with it, but it's um, a new issue. But what we're now seeing is not only geographically distributed teams, but also organizationally distributed teams. In other words, my sales force doesn't work for me. It works for another company and I use it. And my accounting team doesn't work for me. It works for another team, but I use it. And so I have an organization that we now all carry different business cards and we get together around our issues and everyone's working hard at it. But in an hour's time, we're all working for some other organization around some different set of issues. So now as a manager, I'm managing people that I no longer see at the coffee machine every day. And I'm actually managing people who I don't do annual performance reviews for, uh, who have a different pay structure that I may or may not be able to influence that have um, different stat holidays that have different time zones. Like it's the distributed team thing is getting uh, more and more complicated as well. So there's a term that's emerging called future work, or some people call it smart working. And it's about these new emerging ways of working and who I'm working with. Uh, and it sort of embraces work from home. It embraces this um, AI stuff that we've been talking about. Uh, and these distributed organizations that form these virtual corporations. So what's it mean? It means that every company is a tech company at this point in time. That, um, uh, you know, whether you're manufacturing cars or uh, pencils, uh, we have this shift of expectations. We think of what's happening, think of Amazon, right? You can order virtually anything you want in Amazon and an amazing percentage of that shows up tomorrow. And if you don't like it, you can send it back the next day. Well, we're expecting that with everything else I buy, whether it's through Amazon or not. I buy myself a new pair of glasses. I expect them to show up tomorrow with my prescription in them. And if I, my wife doesn't like what they look like, I expect to be able to ship them back the next day. So in order for any of us to survive, we need that tech background. So, and these are just, they're not necessarily COVID related. That might've been a catalyst to accelerate adoption of new technologies, new work methods. But I think we are in a business environment that's not settled out yet, but has the mixture of these things have just been bantering about. I like that. The uh, COVID was the catalyst that led business to adopt, accelerate the adoption of new technologies. At the same time, uh, AI is, is really creating this environment that's really a time warp. It's going to, you know, we're going to come out the other side at, at, at warp speed. Don't look back. Yeah, I think you know moments of rapid innovation occurred when there's huge stressors on um, the world. So a simple example, the biggest stress, of course, would be you know a world war. So World War II, at the beginning of World War II, people uh, were still building biplanes with propellers on them, and you know five years later they were jet airplanes 
uh, and rockets were in the air. Uh, and, you know, the evolution of tanks, right? The Churchill tank went three and a half miles an hour because that's how fast a person could walk. That was, you know, the UK's tank. By the end, the Panther tank was going about 55 kilometers an hour. Um, again, five years later. And so the pandemic's been one of those stressors that's forced us into that that rapid innovation. It's stuff that would have happened anyways, but it might not have happened as quickly. So, that, I mean, that's unpacking that, that, that stressor thing. Merely, I was mistaken in thinking that the pandemic was a point in time stressor. You know, March 2019 was when it happened and it was just uh, like an earthquake. The reverberations have been happening, but I don't think so. I think there's other earthquakes that are happening. And uh, chat GPT would have been a stressor, not as much as COVID, had it occurred by itself. But it's one of a series. So it's a very turbulent business environment. So think of turbulence in the air, right? Or in the ocean, right? When when there's turbulence, there's two ways you can battle that. One is, you know, like a glider, when the wind hits, you just roll with it and you just um, use that energy, but keep moving forward. Uh, or, you know, a small sailboat on the ocean. Um, the opposite strategy is being resilient. So think of an aircraft carrier. It doesn't matter how bad the waves are, more or less that ship can keep on, on progressing. We have the same choice in our organizations. We can be um, responsive, you know, like the small dinghy riding the waves, or we can be resilient. Now, what does resilience look like in the business world? Uh, it looks like companies like Apple and Microsoft that have uh, huge loyal customers, a big cost to shift, a big inventory of cash or a big inventory of, of products and can be resilient to this turbulence. But the rest of us need to figure out how to roll with it, that these things don't cause damage. So that's unpacking the first part. The second part is we've seen experiments with AI already. So a lot of sales tools exist that listen to your Zoom call, your sales based, uh, your Zoom based sales call, and then will give you an analysis of it. And so the analysis will, uh, on the sales side, will indicate the number of closing comments you made in the phone call. It will indicate how many risky comments you made, how many things you, uh, the respondent said about being receptive. And so it's using AI to interpret your sales call. And now it's uh, playing by the numbers, right? Your, the sales team can take a look at this and fine tune their conversation skills based on that immediate feedback. What did it look like 10 years ago or five years ago, your manager would listen to a recording of the call or listen in, in the call and give you coaching afterwards. Well, that means that the sales manager has to at least spend the same amount of time as you in the call and maybe even more time if they're in the call and then listen to the recording and then give you coaching. Whereas now this AI tool gives a manager that synthesis and your manager can now spend instead of an hour or two on you with a related to that one call, it's a 20 minute activity. So we've seen those experiments, they're remarkably intelligent, but the chat GPT takes that to a new level that uh, it's beyond just responding to an experience, it's creating experience out of nothing. And so it's the natural progression, but it's a scary realization that um, it creates a whole bunch of uncertainty in the organization. You and I look at chat GPT in terms of its ability to do what we do, you know, craft words, whether they're, um, you know, spoken or written. But it also has the ability to uh, program. So I want to create something in Python. Uh, I can describe it and chat will go program it for me. So now you begin taking a look at any company's human capital and you say, okay, what percentage of the work that this company does can be outsourced to chat GPT? And the advantage of that, of course, is obviously a cost structure, but it's also a seven by 24 solution, right? We've not only are we getting distributed teams, but we're also getting distributed customers and Many organizations, their limitation is I only have helpline calls 
um, based on business hours in my country of origin. Whereas now I can provide a pretty decent helpline support seven by 24 and obviously in multi languages and um, provide even programming support if that's what the helpline call is about. So it, it is a very huge disruptive um, process to the relationship between the organization and the employee. You afford me in an article that sort of highlights some of the uh, disruption out there, some of the turbulence out there. Can I read the headline and share uh, a bit of it with the uh, yeah. listeners? Uh, so this is from the New York, for New York Times uh, here in mid-January. A wave of job switching has employers on a training treadmill. The rise in turnover since the pandemic started has a cost in productivity. It's taking longer to get stuff out the door. So that's what the Times reported. I have an excerpt here. I'll just read this, Brett, and then we'll come back to you. It said, for nearly two years, companies have complained that they're caught in an unending cycle of hiring and training workers, only to see them leave in a matter of weeks or months. Constant recruiting and training drains management resources, and new hires often do not stick around long enough for that investment to pay off. Veteran employees are often asked to pick up the slack, leading to burnout. Anyway, that's just an excerpt from this article published right here in 2023, first month of the year. And Will, Brett, you uh, you mentioned a huge transition that was underway with the worker contract at the start of this episode. And uh, you don't have to go very far to validate your comments. Uh, but was there something more here? What what else did you find it of interest? Well, so... Um, the- these two topics are obviously closely tied in. I think that our different uh, arrangement with employees, uh, the article that you described, and I read that too, I was quite interested in it, that, um, you know, its examples are things where it's very uh, apparent. So in the fast food industry, it takes six months to get someone up to speed, but the average employment history is like they're shifting jobs in four months. So you're not even getting them up to speed and being productive before they leave. So what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, it'd be nice if we could hire better, but of course that's the the devil that we're fighting with. It would be nice if we could get them productive faster um, and it would be nicer if we could retain them better. So it causes us to focus on training strategies and retention strategies. Because I can solve it either way. I can have, you know, six months of training, but better retention rates, or I can get them up to speed faster. And so how we've traditionally trained people is pretty ineffective. And um, there are many opportunities to make that better. And I'm not going to poke at all of them, but uh, to keep the theme going, even something like chat GPT, is becomes a training instrument because in theory it can uh, listen to your interaction even if you're you know working on the drive-through uh, order desk uh, at the fast food restaurant and give you feedback you know you forgot to ask whether you supersize it um, you know you could have asked this question or that question and so now I can train that person faster as opposed to waiting till the supervisor happens to see something and gives you feedback. Same thing on a customer support call or all the other jobs where we've got this um, long training time at a fairly uh, menial position. This allows us to take a different look at training. You know, we all know that adults learn by doing, yet we insist on having videos for them to watch or articles for them to read on the onboarding process. So I think this is this shock to the system is about rethinking as i said at the beginning this relationship that the organization has with employees so in this case again how do i train them faster and get them on board faster and secondly how do i retain them better and today's conversation is probably about the first 
topic, which is getting people productive. Uh, and we can leave till later how we can think about training. You know, we've talked about the article a bit. We've talked about some general concepts. It's time to use examples. Oh, I, I guess that's my cue. Uh, we have curated three workplace champions uh, this episode. Uh, we've gone back and uh, tried to identify uh, some of the finance leaders we've been speaking to that had some interesting thoughts on talent or a perspective. Uh, what did you make of uh, the three workplace champions this episode, Brett? Yeah, so I think it's, in this case, uh, it should it could be, Jack, an interesting conversation because you've uh, managed to find, as you always have, three interesting clips that are great clips based on a different mindset. So I've spent the last few minutes trying to change our mindset about how we look at employees and the disruptive things that this rise of uncertainty, distributed teams and geographies, you know, this uh, future work is, is changing our agreement. And now when I listen to these three clips, they're all out of phase with what the job market now needs. And so I don't mean to... Um, be critical of these people, but they are insightful of how we used to think about human capital and a leverage point to consider whether it's time to begin thinking about it differently. Well, okay, we'll let them be leverage points this time. But to be honest, our first workplace champion is CFO Stephen Mitchell of Redgate Software. And I had just posed him a question regarding OKRs. He had mentioned them in passing, and I brought it up, and I asked him whether he believed OKRs were you know, part of the fabric of the company, something to that extent anyway. And he responded back, and he gave this nice overview as how, of how he views OKRs. And to be honest, Brad, I thought he was expressing a sentiment that you've shared in the past as well regarding them. Uh, but here, let's listen, and then we can talk about it. And I think the, the way we use them in Redgate, they, they are pretty central. So as, as an example, you know, we, we've just closed out the, the financial year. Um, and, and when we've got a company meeting next week, we will, you know, the first update that we give people on how did we do in 2022 will be to review those OKRs because they are the things we talked about through the year. But, but I, you know, we don't see them as, um, as you say, someone's been allocated a task and a goal. It, it's more, we, we're using them as these are the three big strategic things we're trying to do as a business this year and why, um, and talk about them at that level to the organization. Yeah. And, and yes, they have targets attached to them and we, and we want those results to come through. But, but the discussion is a lot more about, okay, this year, if there's a, an OKR around customer retention, the, me the measure might be our, reten our retention rate going from X to X plus five, whatever it might be. But actually, what are the things we're going to do across the business? And, and I guess I come back to what I said earlier, you know, how, how can we give line of sight to people, whether they're in customer success or software engineering or product management? Can we give line of sight for those people to what, how what they're doing is going to, is going to ladder through to that? So that, that's how we use them. And, and that's why I say, in my mind, you can call them OKRs or, or you can call them strategic initiatives or your, you know, we used to, we had five of them uh, each year, generally way back in, in T-Mobile, they were called the big five. You know, you, you can call them what you like. Um, I think the key thing is about how you articulate them to the organization and how you give people line of sight um, between, you know, their priorities and the company's success and the company's goals. So am I wrong? Didn't uh, Steve just express sort of a sentiment that you have shared here time and again, which is go back decade by decade in time, and you will find sort of a variation of what OKRs do and are about. Uh, would you, am I right? OKRs are, uh, yes, I, I agree with everything that you said. Um, 
OKRs have uh, shifted themselves as part of this world I've just tried to describe at the beginning part of this conversation. And I, I'm going to talk about uh, sort of a modern management system that uh, most of the management systems, like you're describing with Steve's background, date themselves back to, um, they might have been implemented five years ago, but the structures they're built on were designed 10 or 20 years ago. They're designed for a different environment than we live in. Like in what world do you think you can set your strategy just once a year? In what world do you think you can set a financial plan once a year? Uh, not the world that we're currently in. Uh, it's a different reality now. And so what we learned growing up, what Steve learned as a manager growing up, doesn't necessarily work uh, going forward. And so I'm, I'm going to describe a modern management system. So that modern management system requires us to have sort of sensors in all sorts of different areas of the organization. Uh, you know, for example, I talked about strategy. Well, you know, in the strategy world now, we've got, you know, conscious capitalism and, you know, activist investors and so on. Our strategies need to be different than they were before. In Europe and, and in the States with SEC, we now have ESG, you know, environmental, social and governance expectations. That didn't exist with your current business systems that you've designed. You know, our financial monitoring systems are, are outdated. We know that we need you know, non-financial measures. We need, uh, you know, a cadence of monthly or weekly or even daily. And that's where the OKRs come in as another example. Um, you know, if we take a look at IT, right? Again, now everything is cloud-based. That wasn't how it was five years ago. The AI that we've talked about is new. Like I can just layer on in each and every area what we need for our management systems are different than what they were before. And so we need a way to harvest this knowledge from these disparate um, systems. And I believe OKRs are that because if I'm looking at conscious capitalism, again, I've got objectives, I've got key results. I'm looking at active as investors, I've got objectives, I have key results. I'm looking at uh, cloud or AI, I've got objectives, I have key results. So what OKRs become is the new language of business. And the new management system is a system that incorporates OKRs from all these different um, source systems and put them onto one dashboard for the organization. So again, think of the dashboard of your car. It brings things from the fuel system, from the engine system, from the wheel system, from you know the road system outside, from your navigation system, and they put it all onto one dashboard for you. That's the progression that we're moving towards. And so um, your story about Stephen's evolution to here and his use of OKRs sort of parallels, I'm suggesting, how we need to manage our organizations going forward. Are human uh, resource professionals experts uh, when it comes to OKRs? I don't think so. I, I think perhaps the HR leader would need to be, but for, and, and a lot of organizations don't necessarily have that senior HR leader. They have a HR administrator that might have a HR VP title in, in mid-size organizations, I'm speaking. In any case, I don't think they spend a lot of time talking about or thinking about OKRs. Well, I'd say the short answer is uh, no. Uh, and it's not just the HR people that don't, it's finance people that don't, it's sales people that don't. But the broader answer is, as we've talked about before, OKRs are just the modern manifestation of, of as far back as Peter Drucker's work on management by objectives, right? You set an objective and then you manage against it. OKRs are just the current version of that. Where um, it comes to rest here, whether it's with the CFO or an HR person, or often they're, they're both the same, is um, the the cadence, the drum beats much faster. So we've talked before about how we've got to onboard employees faster and make them productive more faster. Well, we better set objectives and measure whether that's occurring or not. And the employee needs feedback as more continuous. I mean, back when, when I started working, you were lucky to get an annual performance review. Whereas 
the expectation these days is I, I get an update every month and maybe even every week. I have a CFR, you know, a quick conversation with my boss about what's going on. So the cadence in this side of the world is no different than the increased cadence in other places. Where it becomes stressful is us as accountants are used to the accounting drumbeat, the annual budget, uh, the quarterly report, uh, the monthly close the books. So we're living in a world where our cadence as accountants is much slower than the cadence of business and the cadence of HR. So um, I argue, and one part of the problem that we had, and you know, that I'm going back in time, but while I was teaching our two base costing at Harvard, uh, the limitation of ABC was that cadence, that the gap rules got in the way of us being able to track business fast enough. And at the time, we came up with the concept of the bell scorecard, which is the predecessor to OKRs, with the need of getting financial and non-financial measures. I think the same thing is here. Steve's talking about OKRs as a proxy for, let's get some numbers that are outside the financial world and outside the financial cadence. And so if you listen to what he's talking about at Redgate, it's about non-financial measures and it's about a better cadence that OKRs. And I don't care what you call them. You could call them the four disciplines of execution for DX or um, some people read the book Traction. They call them EOS. Uh, some people call them OGSM. They're all flavors of the same thing. The story here is about cadence. Well, our next workplace champion, Brett, will be Jared Poff, CFO of Designer Brands. I thought uh, it would be interesting to have a uh, a designer of shoes in the mix, uh, not, not a tech company, really. Uh, a retailer, uh, or at least a, a big part of the model is retail. They're based in Columbus, Ohio. And, of course, Jarrett had a uh, quite a tale uh, to tell regarding COVID. And uh, we've heard these tales before, but it's always great uh, to understand how companies weathered the storm as far as talent is concerned. And I interviewed uh, Jarrett just in the last few weeks. So here's... Jared Poff, looking back, sharing his talent tale regarding COVID. Yeah, you know, um, we, we absolutely are looking at talent differently. Um, I, I, I would, I, I would say, I've, I've always, I always feel like we've, we, we've uh, prided ourselves in our culture and how how we show up in the eyes of our employees, and then that's evidenced by low turnover and things like that. However, you know. The, the realities of COVID meant I had to I had to furlough eighty percent of the people. So that means I, I can't pay you, and I don't know when I can bring you back. But I, I hope I can. We did. We brought brought back most everyone. Um, um, but allowing us to be comfortable with change has allowed us to continue um, to to retain our good talent and and acquire new new and better talent. And as a, as a great example of that, um, in twenty twenty. I unfortunately, through health reasons, lost um, my head of internal audit, and there was not the caliber of, of replacement I was able to find in Columbus, which normally would have been where you needed to have that 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 team reside. Um, I convinced the audit committee, which technically internal audit reports to, even though the CFO manages it on a day-to-day -day basis, I convinced the audit committee to allow me to hire that person as a remote hire because we had already proven you can work from anywhere and do a lot of our job. And um, it was it was a trial basis, but they gave me the permission to do that. And that allowed me to poach someone from, from at that time it was from Walmart, which had a huge international compliance structure, which we knew we needed as we were becoming this brand builder, much bigger retailer. And I would have never been on the radar because they were not gonna move from Arkansas up to Ohio. But I hired this lady, um, absolutely the best hire um, in that role that, that the company's ever had. The audit committee hands down said it was it was the right test to do. They would do it again. Since then, she's built out her entire team with not a single nexus between them or to Columbus, but it has allowed her to bring in talent that is very diverse and, and very much more skilled than what you can get by just fishing in that small uh, pool. And so we have we have deployed that across um, not just finance, but across, you know, m most of designer brands and really allows us to, to look and act and retain talent very differently. 
So heads, head of stores that, again, would have typically been in Columbus, now resides in Hilton Head, but still can do her job from anywhere. And, and it, it makes her more um, endeared, enduring to to, DS, or to designer brands and then, you know, should, should we say she had to move to Columbus? So I, I think there has been a change in a good way. Um, I think that he's, uh, Jerry is, is uh, bang on. I mean, he's uh, a good example of a high stressed industry. Right. He talks about furloughing uh, 80 percent of the employees. Uh, and that's, you know, that's emotionally tough on the leadership as well as the employee, but also obviously a huge stressor to the business and the business continuity and success itself. So you're, you're kind of having to rebuild, you know, a, a brand new organization post COVID. The dilemma is all the rules of the game have changed. Right. COVID um forced us all to live through amazon and those expectations that we talked about in the introduction and so the world of retail is very different and certainly my perception is anyone that's walked through a mall recently you can you can you know, visibly see the difference in the mall now than what it was uh four years ago and so it's got to be uh a stressor on all bricks and mortar businesses. Uh, and even going digital is a bit of a, a concern because the cost to go digital compared to the cost of just selling your products through Amazon has to be a tough consideration for organizations. So uh, he's got uh, more stressors on his business than uh, hopefully others of your, your listeners. But that doesn't mean it's a done deal. It turns out that all of us still need to wear shoes or many of us have to wear shoes. And, um, you know, what designer brands offers is still valuable, but the channel is different than it was before. And so in the introduction, I said that, you know, there's a bunch of stressors on business and I categorize them as the rise of uncertainty, check mark for Jared, distributed teams, check mark for Jared. Every company is a tech company, check mark for Jared. Um, the, the future work is hitting them, check mark for Jared. And agile everything. So it's just a good example of um, the stressors on an organization. And Jared doesn't come to us with any prescription of what the solution is, but it's a good example of how all of us have one or more of these stressors on the organization. And even those that have all of them, like Designer Brands has, doesn't, doesn't mean the organization is dead, but you do need to be agile and rethink what that business model looks like. Today's conversation, though, is about the human capital side. So given those stressors, what does it mean on how we manage those employees that we're bringing back on and uh, help them uh, get on board faster, like we talked about to begin with, and retain them better. Well, our next workplace champion is uh, Tom Fenimore, who is CFO of Luminar Technologies. Tom's episode will be released Sunday, January 29th, but I thought it was a good opportunity to share some of his thoughts here on, on talent. And just to uh, underscore some of what we've been talking about here, how disruptive a chapter we're currently in. As you'll hear, uh, Tom begins by comparing this moment in time that we're coming through to the dot-com bust, which he remembers at the start of his career. Anyway, he begins with that comparison, and then he has a few additional notes in terms of how to, how to compensate employees and the challenge certain companies are facing there. Here's Tom Fenimore. been blessed at Luminar where our employee turnover is well below the industry averages, particularly for a tech company. Uh, I think a big part of that is the uh, very credible success that we have in front of us. The people at Luminar, while at any, you know, while at any company, you know, there are, there are certain challenges we face, 
But I think overall, Austin has done a good job of building a good team and our turnover has been well below um, the industry average. Um, we're also, particularly with the pullback we're seeing in the tech industry, the caliber of talent we've been able to hire over the last several months has increased significantly. The big tech companies are pulling back. Some of the automotive companies are, are shutting down their autonomy operations. A lot of our competitors are running out of cash and they look at Luminar as a company that has real business we're launching, real technology, a strong balance sheet and a very bright future. So we've been able to attract the very high caliber talent uh, over the last several months. And you combine that with a low turnover rate and look, we're always, you know, looking to hire the best talent and particularly for a growing organization, that's important. But we have never faced an issue of Luminar of not be able to hire uh, the right individual for an open role that we have. In terms of, of compensation, once again, going back to some of the lessons that I personally learned from the dot-com bust is those companies that went public in the late 90s used employee options as their primary compensation tool. And as the, the stock, uh, you know, the tech bubble collapsed, those options became very far out of the money and it created an employee motivation issue and caused a lot of employee turnover. Uh, we paid our employees primarily in options before we went public, but when we went public, we moved to playing our employees in, in RSUs. And um, we prepared for a sharp market correction in case the 2020, 2021, you know, uh, strong market turned out to be a bubble and that bubble bursted, which it has. And we took steps to prepare for that. And one of them is how we paid our employees. Yes, uh, the RSUs that we gave our employees have less value than what they were a year ago, just from a function of the stock price going down, but there's still a large amount of value there. And our employees tend to recognize that um, Luminar is going to be a long-term winner here. They see the credible path we're on, and a lot of them are willing to be patient because they see that credible upside coming as soon as the market settles down and we execute on our plan. Tom brings it all together, right? He's brought to the forefront uh, what we talked about in the introduction, the idea that we need to decrease turnover somehow or the other or increase retention, whether you're a you know glass half full or half empty type person. Uh, and so that's his lever, number one. And then the second is, you know, how do we get better caliber in our, our candidates? And so you know, he points out that even though he's in the automotive sector, uh, it's a technical space and there's a lot of technical people available. And again, in the introduction, I said that, you know, it's getting to the point where every company is a tech company. And Lunamar is a good example of one that's specifically bridging that gap between a traditional technology, the automobile, and new technology, you know, these long range sensors. And so uh, what he's doing is uh, understanding that the candidates are different than they were before. What's available is different than what was available because of changes to job market, but also um, how he sees employing and using these people. And he's very clear on something that you and I have talked about before, and that is compensation isn't the only lever, right? He's clear that based on recent market trends, they, the stock options and stuff that they joined with are of significantly lower value than they would have hoped and thought at this point in time but that's not a barrier to people joining and, and being retained so understand that the uh, agreement with our employees is more complicated than just the compensation model yes it's got to be there and there's got to be in this case a hope for the future but there's more to it than that and i think you know tom's done a good job of bringing all together that we've got to reduce turnover have higher caliber candidates that can get up to speed faster and understand that we need to retain them and compensation's part of that equation. So I think 
he's not as academic about it as I have uh, overlaid, but he's the example of everything that we've been touching on so far. Well, we've kept you longer than promised, Brett, uh, but we had some ground to cover this time. And and I'd just like to wrap up by circling back to what we began discussing up front, of course, chat GPT. Uh, more than anything, what sets this type of technology apart, it's the speed. It's we, we know that this is all going to happen in an exponential way, whereas in the past, in, if, in my way of thinking, this is just going to feed off itself so much quicker going forward, and therefore the disruption is going to be that much more painful. Well, I would argue uh, I agree with part A and disagree with part B. So A is it's going to happen much faster than we can imagine. Uh, but the B part is, does it have to be as difficult and disruptive? And that part I disagree with. It, it, we need to get to a point where it is not difficult and disruptive. We need to get to the point where we're agile and we can take stressors like this in my turbulent environment metaphor is, you know, either fight it or roll with it. But um, something like AI, I sure as heck wouldn't want to be the one fighting with it. It, it seems to me to be pretty much an, an inevitable journey. The trick is how to, in that, we've all seen those curves that look at um, transformation of technology from, you know, buggies to automobiles and automobiles to airplanes and airplanes to rockets like that. We're in that, that point of transition here. You don't want to jump technologies too soon and, and blow your brains out on the expense of that shift but you don't want to wait so long that your competitors have deeply ensconced themselves before you get the chance to begin uh, reacting and, and building around that new technology. So it doesn't need to be difficult and we should learn to stop fighting the darn thing and learn to get on board at the right moment for our business. I think chat GPT has made it clear to everyone, I should hope that it's time to make that leap. The uh first movers who are successful will be the ones who correctly diagnosed how to adapt and use the new technology uh, to better manage their organizations or their people or to lessen their costs overall. Yeah, I mean, we, we could take on all those topics because um, all those things are hit by this AI and uh, by this, I'm going to call it this, you know, modern way of managing businesses. Uh, but our topic on this podcast is about human capital and human capital is probably more impacted by this than any other area because this will clearly replace headcount. Um, this will clearly help the headcount we have become better, more productive uh, and and used where they can add greater value. And so what's... Uh, you know, we, t we take a look at headcount and in the average business, you know, between 30 and 50 percent of the employees are knowledge workers. So between 30 and 50 percent of your employees are impacted by uh, this technology. It's going to impact everything from uh, identifying candidates to interviewing candidates to hiring candidates to onboarding candidates to get them productive to retain them like the whole thing changes and the companies that grapple with this first are the ones that are going to succeed and those that don't are going to look to our children like those companies that kept on building buggy whips even though cars were driving past their front window there it is how's that you've done it again Hi, it's Jack. If you haven't yet subscribed to Workplace Champions, you'll find us on Apple Podcasts. Or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify. If you like the show, please recommend it to a friend. Thanks for listening to Workplace Champions, a CFO Thought Leader production.